St. Anthony of Padua is probably the best known Franciscan in the entire history of the 800 years that the Franciscan order has been in existence. And up until St. Anthony came on the scene, St. Francis would never allow his friars to study. He was always afraid that if they became the intelligentsia, they might be too big for their own britches, too self-important. And that's why St. Francis forbade studies at the beginning until he met St. Anthony of Padua. And he made St. Anthony his first lector of theology because St. Anthony was humble and brilliant at the same time. And ever since then, there has been a beautiful tradition of studies in the Franciscan order. Now we have several doctors of the church, like Lawrence of Rindisi, the Capuchin Franciscan, we have others, too, who are brilliant and have guided the church in ways that really were like a spillover of the Holy Spirit to the minds and hearts of those who would believe in Jesus Christ. That made the heart of St. Francis very, very happy because he loved the church. He loved the church with all of his heart. He loved the church because the church gave Christ to us, and he loved the house of God, the church building, because it housed the Blessed Sacrament. St. Francis's full focus was the crucified, because there he saw the love of God so perfect in every way, and his great aim in life was to imitate the crucified. His beautiful prayer was, love is not loved. And he would weep, hoping and praying that people would respond to the great outpouring of generosity from the heart of God in Jesus Christ. Through a lifetime, St. Francis requested just two things from God. The first was to suffer in his own body, insofar as he could take it, exactly what Jesus Christ suffered when he died on the cross. And on September the 17th, 1224, St. Francis' body was marked with the marks of the crucified. And he carried this most painfully within his frame for two years and two weeks until he died on October the 3rd, 1226. But the second thing that St. Francis asked for from God was to carry in his heart the love that Christ had for us and for his heavenly Father when he died on the cross. He knew he needed the love to bear the pain, and love is the only thing that can make pain bearable. And for a man like St. Francis, it was a question of joy in suffering, not because he was some sort of masochist who would get pleasure out of pain inflicted upon him, but because suffering conformed him to the crucified, to the one who loved him so very much. But the bottom line in Christianity is not crucifixion. The bottom line in Christianity is resurrection. That's why we're Christians. Crucifixion at the time of Christ was very common. We have historical accounts where the Romans did as many as 500 crucifixions on a single day. When the armies of Titus and Vespasian came into Jerusalem in the year 70, Flavius Josephus says they ran out of trees to crucify the Jews on. What is most uncommon is resurrection. And that's why St. Francis was a Christian and why all of us would be Christian too, knowing that this God revealed by Jesus Christ overcame death, sin, Satan, and hell. That one miracle of the resurrection was greater than all the other miracles of Jesus Christ put together to prove that he was God. Even when he raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus would die a second time, 
to await the common resurrection of us all on the last day. But once Jesus Christ rose from the dead, there's no more dying for him. He's alive. He's well. He's with us. And if you and I so choose, he is within us. He left no stone unturned to prove that he was God. Even when that stone was his own tombstone. And that tombstone of his turned out to be the cornerstone for your faith and mine. And if he is not risen from the dead, in the words of St. Paul in Pittsburgh translation, <laughs> we're all a bunch of damn fools. You're crazy for believing, and we are even more stupid for trying to preach or to teach. The whole Christian faith rises or falls with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That one miracle of the resurrection is greater than all the fulfillment of prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the Old Testament. Some people have counted 120 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament. If he fulfilled just three of those 120 prophecies, do you know what the odds would be? Are you into probability? Do, do you play the state lottery? Fulfilling just three of those 120 prophecies, the odds would be one out of 10 to the 15th power. That is, one out of 10 with 15 zeros behind it. That's like going to the state of Texas covering the width and breadth of that state with silver dollars, one foot thick, and then taking one of those silver dollars and painting it black, hiding it among the rest, and then sending somebody in there blindfolded to fetch that one silver dollar painted black, his chances would be one out of 10 to the 15th power. And they are the odds if he fulfilled just three of those 120 prophecies. Not a bad argument, but the resurrection is even greater than that. The resurrection is greater than all of his teachings put together to prove that he's God. And what teacher in the history of the world could ever come close to the one who called himself the way, the truth, and the life? I am the life and the resurrection, he added, He's everything. He knows what's on the other side of the grave because that's where he came from. Maybe you heard about that man who wanted to start his own religion. This fellow had been an entrepreneur of sorts, very successful in his business ventures. He wanted to start a new religion that everybody could join, everybody could be comfortable with, a religion that would not make too many demands upon his followers. So he did a smart thing. He wrote a letter to the then editor of the Denver Catholic Register, at that time, Monsignor Matthew Smith. Listen to this letter. Dear Monsignor, you will no doubt be surprised when you hear of my projected undertaking. I'm going to start a new universal religion that everybody can join, everybody can be comfortable with. But I realize my deficiencies. Hence, I'm appealing to you from the great fund of your knowledge as to what stand the Catholic Church will take in regard to my new religion. Well, Monsignor Matthew Smith answered that man's letter thus. Dear sir, you flatter me in thinking that I can be of some help to you in this grandiose plan of yours. I cannot really help you at all. I can, however, give you one suggestion you might have yourself crucified until death and the third day after rise from the dead. That should help. Very truly yours, Monsignor Smith. Life at its longest in this world is very, very short compared to eternity. And that's why I will not throw my lot with, with anybody in this world unless he lived for me he died for me, he rose for me, and he loves me. 
And the only one in the history of the world that fills that bill is the God revealed by Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. That's why we're Christians. And that's why it's so sad to see so many young people wander off to the cults of the East Coast and West Coast, maybe following that man who's now on his fourth wife, and he calls her the New Eve. He didn't rise from the dead. It wasn't too long ago that I saw him emerging from jail for not paying his own taxes. How in the name of heaven could anybody throw their lot in with somebody like that and giving him their life savings and kiss Jesus Christ goodbye in the process? This is really beyond me. Our Christian faith is our greatest possession. We praise and thank God for it and for that beautiful grace of final perseverance to the end until we breathe our last before we have that embrace with him for all eternity. Jesus Christ may be many, many different things to many, many different people, but there's one thing I am sure he is not. He is not a liberal whom we can pick and choose from among his teachings and call ourselves his follower. Impossible. If you ever think that Jesus Christ is a liberal, listen to some of these things that come from his mouth. Unless you believe and you're baptized, you will not be saved. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you accept the kingdom of God like a little child, you will never enter into it. Unless you forgive, you will not be forgiven. And do you want to know where safe sex begins with Jesus Christ? Right from his own lips. Even if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he has already committed adultery in his heart. The act doesn't even have to be externalized in his frame or her frame because the citadel of morality where good is done or evil is perpetrated is in the human heart. And he made the human heart. And he knows what makes for that heart's happiness, not just in the next world, but very much so in this world too. And he wants us to be happy. And there is no happiness outside the will of our God. Impossible. If you do think he's a liberal, consider this too. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. It's almost as though he's taking his precious body and blood and shoving it down our throats. But no, he doesn't operate that way. Unless those lips part and the teeth become unclenched, he will not force entry. He only works out of the freedom of the human heart. And when I read the New Testament too, I have no more proof for the existence of a heaven than I do for the existence of a hell. If I believe in the one, I had better believe in the other. And then the toughest one of all for everybody in this world, without exception, what you have done to the least of my brethren, you have done unto me. In other words, we love God no more than the person we love the least. Did you hear that? We love God no more than the person we love the least. Does that make you squirm too? We love God no more than the person we hate the most. Think of the person that you hate the most. I hope you're not married to that individual. Nobody who watches EWTN hates anybody else, do they? The person you're tempted to hate the most. Think on that person. You love God no more than you love that person. You think Christianity is easy? Christianity is absolutely impossible 
without the help of our God. And that's why Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And yet we hear the consolation from St. Paul, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. With God, all things are possible. So why would we turn our looks to Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, because he's the only one who has credibility and authenticity to uphold such a tremendously high moral code. That's why Nietzsche, for example, said he thought it was absolutely impossible. But we know with Christ it is possible, and his grace will be there for us. But there's a second question to be answered. Why Catholic Christian? Now, that's a very special kind of Christian. It used to be in certain circles that Catholics weren't considered Christian, maybe because of the unchristian behavior of so many of us Catholics. I remember asking that question at one of our retreats for these youngsters getting ready for confirmation. There were about 100 in that class in the eighth grade, about 13, 14 years of age. I said, why are you kids Catholic? And one kid raised his hand. I wasn't expecting such a quick response. And the second surprise I got was he stood up. And third surprise was, I thought I saw him stick out his chest a little bit when he answered. And I said, why are you Catholic? And he said, I'm Italian. And us Italians are Catholic. Wonderful answer. He was honoring the faith of his dear parents. A good answer, but not good enough. I don't care what your ethnic background might be. It will not be enough to keep you in the faith if you're blaming the church for the hurts of life. You will be looking for a way to get out from under in a way which may be very disapproved of by our God. Why was St. Francis Catholic? The vir totaliter catholicus, the man who was totally Catholic and admired by so many who are not Catholics and simply for two reasons. He believed that our Holy Father now, Pope John Paul II, is the vicar of Jesus Christ on earth, the one who takes the place of Jesus Christ in a very visible, audible, tangible way. And when we hear him, we hear Peter, we hear Jesus Christ himself. He's the only one in the whole Christian world who can bring unity to the teachings of Christ the unity for which Christ prayed the night before he died, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, in me, and I in thee, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The real mark of credibility for the Christian faith is its unity. And where can you find unity in the Christian faith outside the person of the Holy Father? When right now in the United States of America alone, we have over 400 non-Catholic Christian denominations, 28,000 non-Catholic Christian denominations in the world. Do you really think that's the mind of Christ? And we love these dear people. My whole youth was spent with non-Catholic Christians. My best friend all through my youth was a little Presbyterian by the name of Jimmy Swearingen. He ended up as a sports writer for the Cleveland Browns football team. Jimmy used to come down to confession with us too at St. Cecilia's in Rochester, Pennsylvania. I used to play softball and football for Reverend Stewart's first Baptist team on Adams Street and Vermont Avenue in Rochester, Pennsylvania. My brother Paul and I managed the playground for the Salvation Army. We used to box over at the Episcopal Church until the Knights of Columbus bought their property. And we always used to go to the Lutheran strawberry festivals. <laughs> Lutheran strawberries always seem to taste better than Catholic strawberries. And the best living people that I've ever met in my life were Methodists, our next door neighbors, the Fogels, two neurosurgeons in that family and two school teachers. We love these people. But when it comes to doctrine, insofar as they depart from the complete revelation of Jesus Christ, in the Catholic Christian faith, we have some problems. So the first reason why we're Catholic Christians is our belief that the Holy Father is the vicar of Jesus Christ on earth. And the second reason, 
very simply, we believe that in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we have the body, the blood, the soul, the divine nature of the God-man, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful gift that is, made available through the death of our Lord on the cross and represented in the way that he gave himself to us the night before he died. And he still comes in the form of bread because there's so much hunger in the world. He still comes in the form of sacrifice because there's so much suffering in the world. He still comes in the form of loving union, uniting love, because there's so much loneliness in the world. Probably the greatest suffering of all, maybe greater than all the rest put together, that loneliness. He still comes in the smallness and quiet of the sacred host because of that meekness and humility into which he is forever inviting you and me to enter. He still comes in the form of a very stable, secure, faithful commitment. When there's so much insecurity, instability, infidelity in the world. And he still comes in the form of a substance which is ingested because there's so much addiction in the world. And the only legitimate addiction, this side of heaven, is addiction to the substance of the body, the blood, the soul, the divine nature of the God-man Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. There is no other. And if you or I try to bite into anything else, seeking that ultimate high, all we're going to end up with is a mouthful of sawdust or something like the fodder that's meant to feed the pigs. With the Holy Eucharist, you and I literally end up with a mouth full and a heart full of our God. Not even Almighty God Himself could have given us any more. And St. Francis is our beautiful guide in these wonderful reasons for being Catholic Christians. Any decision that he had to make, he would run to Rome to seek the blessing of Innocent III or Honorius III. And that was the very thing that preserved his reform after the Fourth Lateran Council from ending in the pitfalls of heresy. When so many around him, like the Fraticelli, the poor men of Lyons, the Cathri, the Albigensium, all left the church and left the ways of God. And nobody knows them anymore but people who study history books. But everybody who knows St. Francis loves him because he was so beautifully obedient and so devoted to the body and blood of Jesus Christ. He said he saw nothing corporally, physically, of the Most High Son of God, but his most holy body and blood, which priests receive and which they alone administer to others. And that's why we pray with our St. Francis, and I beseech thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, that the fiery and sweet strength of thy love may absorb our souls from all things under heaven, that we may die for love of thy love, as thou didst deign to die for love of our love. St. Francis, vir totaliter catholicus, be our guide. Please, we need your help in these times when our faith is so much endangered. I'll never forget our ordination ceremony to the priesthood on June the 4th, 1955 in the crypt of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, Washington, D.C. Right toward the end of that beautiful ceremony, we went up in front of Bishop McNamara for the last time as part of that ceremony, and he took his long bony fingers, I can still feel them, and pressed the heads of each of us. There were 40 in that class that day. He pressed so hard I thought I was going right through that marble floor and he said, 
what Jesus said to the apostles Easter Sunday night when he gave them their Easter present. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Retain means not to forgive. Therefore, to forgive or not to forgive depends upon a judgment. Who can make a judgment but a judge? Somebody who has an ear to hear. And this is why we have and we keep our auricular confession. We put our sins into the ear of another human being who in the name and power of Jesus Christ is able to wipe away perhaps the crusted filth of decades. It's true, only God can forgive sins because sin is an offense against God. And all the priest is the instrument for the power of God. As St. Augustine put it so well, for a priest to restore the life of God in grace to a soul is a greater achievement than the creation of the world at the beginning of time. And at the moment of absolution, the priest actually identifies himself with the Son of God, so much so that if a priest would ever dare to say over a penitent in confession, may Christ absolve you from your sins instead of, I absolve you from your sins, those sins would not be taken away in virtue of the sacramental absolution. The priest acts in persona Christi, in the very person of Jesus Christ. A wonderful gift of peace. When St. Francis would see one of his little friars down in the pits, depressed, he would side up to him gently and whisper into his ear, Brother, Maybe you better get the confession. I used to think that was wild. After being a priest for more than 45 years, I think St. Francis was right on target. And if our nation is 40% chronically depressed at the present time, maybe, just maybe, sin has something to do with that depression. There's a psychiatrist in Pittsburgh, not a Catholic, who said that if the thousands of his clients over the years could have gained a deep and abiding Catholic faith, he said most of us psychiatrists would have to go out of business. Sounds like an exaggeration, doesn't it? And then I hear Carl Gustav Jung, probably the biggest name in psychiatry for the entirety of the 20th century. This man treated thousands and thousands of patients with mental, emotional, and psychological disorders. But he said in all the years of his practice and teaching, he could remember treating only five or six believing Catholics. And he attributed the whole thing to the sacrament of penance the right of reconciliation. God really wants us to have his peace. In fact, he appeared nine times after his resurrection from the dead, and each time it was a message of peace, peace after the battle of Calvary. Not the peace of the cemetery, because we're alive. Not the peace of the prison, because we're free people but the peace that comes from being one with our God and his holy will. We found a tribe over in Papua New Guinea where I spent 14 years among some of the most primitive people in the world, a tribe there who, when they have guilt on their consciences, go out into the bush and find a special type tree and actually confess their sins to the tree in order to get relief. Sometimes we wish we could do that. Go out into the bush, find a special type tree, preferably a dead tree, one that wouldn't talk back to us, dump our load like a load of manure, 
and then off free as a bird. But our God, the God revealed by Jesus Christ, was the greatest psychologist, the supreme psychiatrist who really knows the needs of the human heart. And that's why he gave us this wonderful sacrament. And it is a great gift to all of us. Just to establish a little bit of credibility here, I want you to know that I go to confession every two weeks. My confessor right now is 20 years younger than I am. And the one I had just before that is 30 years younger. And they're really updated in their theology. And they all have good hearing too. I don't get away with a thing. It's a beautiful way, I believe, to keep that sensitivity to God and his expectations. A sensitivity to sin. And isn't that what we've lost in our culture today? You see, the greatest evil in the world is not sin. The greatest evil in the world is the denial of sin. Compunction, contrition, sorrow, get rid of sin. But the denial of sin perpetuates the sin. And you and I are the losers in the process. But the ultimate in sin, beyond which none of us can possibly go, is to call evil good. And isn't that the situation right now? The killing of the preborn is now called pro choice, as though these dear folks are in favor of free will. And their opponents are called anti choice. Suicide. It has a new name, too. Death with dignity. Pornography. Intrinsically evil. Always and never can never, ever be justified. Its new name is freedom of speech. Homosexual marriages. Alternate lifestyle. I think our God would call it something quite different from that Maybe something closer to the abomination of desolation. But just know, God always forgives if we are sorry. Man sometimes forgives. Nature never forgives. And if you and I try to suppress our guilt down into the unconscious or the subconscious, or somewhere on the fringe of consciousness, sooner or later that guilt will assert itself in some bizarre form of behavior or other. Guilt will always out, always. No exceptions to this. And that's why our God gave us this beautiful sacrament of his peace. As a missionary going to, coming back from Papua New Guinea, I have been around the world four times. And every time I went, I would stop like at 10, 12, 15 different places along the way. In all of my travels, I've never heard or even read about a more consoling story than the one I learned going through a little town in Italy called Foligno, right from the autobiography of Angela of Foligno. She had in her youth the misfortune to commit a very shameful, horrible, ugly, mortal sin. She was deathly afraid to tell the priest. She thought if she told this into the priest in confession, he'd knock her full head off. In fact, Father never even heard that sin before, sheltered life that he's always lived, you know. So when she came to confession, fear, shame sealed her lips. And out of human respect, because everybody else was doing it, she went to communion the next day and made a sacrilegious communion on top of a sacrilegious confession until she reached a point in her thinking, well, I'm going to hell anyhow. I might as well live it up the rest of the way. Until one night, her favorite saint appeared to her, Francis of Assisi. And he said, Angela, what I want you to do is to get the confession to this particular priest and there make a necessary general confession. That's exactly what she did. From that moment on, she started onto the road to a beautiful life of holiness to become one of the great little saints in the church today. If this has ever been your problem, anything close to it, perhaps you've been acting out of doubt, when the doubt could have so easily been resolved simply by asking a question, 
I say to you today, folks, for Christ's sake, and I mean it literally, for the sake of Jesus Christ and your own as well, do not carry that burden of guilt one week longer. It's very, very difficult to live up to the complete revelation of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Christian faith. It really is. And for trying to do that, you and I should have at least one return, and that is peace of mind and heart and soul. But we'll never have that unless our consciences are right with God. And that may well start with a good confession. We are Christians because we believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. We are Catholic Christians because of the Holy Father and the Holy Eucharist. But the two beautiful corollaries that flow from our Catholic Christianity, the way we honor and love the one who channeled our God to us, Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, and the way we handle our guilt as given to us by Jesus himself in the sacrament of penance, a great Easter present from our God. All mortal sins must be submitted to the power of the keys. In other words, all mortal sins must be confessed. And if a person did not commit a grave or grievous or serious or big sin, they really would not have to go to confession the rest of their lives. But we strongly recommend frequent confession to keep that beautiful sensitivity to God and his expectations as St. Francis did, whose all-night-long prayer to God would be, Who are you, God most dear? Who am I but a useless, worthless, little worm of a servant? St. Francis would consider himself the greatest sinner in the world because he saw himself in the light of God's knowledge. It's like a room where there may be trillions of particles of dust, but we don't see them until a bar of morning sunlight comes in and then we see suspended thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions of these dust particles. And that's what the saints did like St. Francis. They let the light of God come into their lives. And that's why they would respond to themselves as he did. Not that we would ever want anybody to become scrupulous, to see sin where there is no sin, or to see grave sin where there is only venial sin. Oh no, we never want that. But the big danger in our culture today is not scrupulosity, but unscrupulosity, the callous conscience that does not even see sin at all at any time whatsoever. Like one pastor in Cleveland told me, he says his people there in his parish, big parish too, like 2,000 families, they have no problem at all with the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know that Mary was conceived without original sin? He said he thought all of his people considered themselves immaculately conceived. They don't go to confession anymore. Whom are we trying to kid? We are not the church of the Latter-day Saints. We are the church of the modern-day sinners. Every last single one of us if we are truly honest, as with St. Francis of Assisi. He would not try to hide from his God. He knew what he was before God, no more, no less. And he would respond, too, with a beautiful penitential practice beyond the actual confessing of the sin. We, too, want to follow this man, too, because the degree of our shame is the degree of our pride. The degree of our sorrow is the degree of our love. And this is the beautiful seraphic saint. The seraphim are the highest choir of angels, highest because they're closest to God. They love God more than anybody else. You see, a person's position in heaven or the intensity with which they enjoy the beatific vision is always determined by their love. And one day, one of our little brothers, Pacifico, saw St. Francis sitting in heaven in the place that Lucifer lost. Just a tradition, filled with love, truly a holy man. And that's the best definition of holy 
filled with love. When we go to confession, we really don't have to worry what the priest may think. His lips are sealed forever by the sacramental seal, and they can never, never be unsealed. In fact, if you told the priest in confession that you had one unkind thought about your spouse, he would sooner have to give up his life than tell another person that you had mentioned that in confession. And to my knowledge, the seal of confession has never been broken. Maybe you know the story of the patron saint of priests who hear confessions, St. John the Pomacene. St. John the Pomacene was the confessor to the Queen of Bohemia. The King of Bohemia was a pig-headed sort of a fellow by the name of Wenceslaus. Now, this is not good King Wenceslaus of the Christmas Carol. This fellow was a real louse. He was a jackass from the word start, extremely jealous of the king or the queen. He wanted to know what she had to tell when she came to confession. And, of course, Father John told him to go chase himself. He wasn't getting anything out of him. So he ended up by threatening the priest. And he said that either her confession or your life and that night they trussed up Father John the Pomacene, hand and foot, tossed him from the bridge at Prague into the icy waters of the Moldau. Confessor, confession, both went down together, but the secret of the seal of confession was safe under those black sliding waters. And that's what every Catholic knows when they go into a confessional. They're like a man standing at the stern of a ship at midnight, dropping their sins like stones, into a deep, dark, silent ocean, sins that will forever be hidden from the gaze of men, forever buried in the mercy of God. There's an interesting footnote to that story. They recovered the body of St. John the Pomacene from the Moldau River, and they buried him. 300 years later, they exhumed his body. They dug him up. His body was totally corrupt except for one part of his body which was just as soft and pliable as it was the day he died, his tongue. And if you want to see that tongue, go to the Church of St. Vitus in Prague in the Czech Republic, and there in a beautiful reliquary is the tongue of John the Pomacene, as though the Lord were putting his seal upon the seal of confession. What a wonderful grace it is to have somebody in our lives that we can trust in that fashion. When they asked Gilbert Keith Chesterton why he became Catholic, and I believe Gilbert Keith Chesterton is the greatest convert to the Catholic faith in the English-speaking world during the entire history of the 20th century. <laughs> Private opinion, of course. He answered by saying, I want to have my sins taken away. He knew that the power of binding and loosing was given to this church, and he wanted to be morally certain, absolutely sure, that his sins were taken away. Not a bad reason at all for submitting to the power of the church. When we were students in sacred theology in Washington, D.C., we used to attend classes at the Paulus College. A Father McGinn would come in from New York City each Friday, and the Capuchin Franciscans would go. And this one day, he was talking about a peculiar habit he had reading the New York Times where he lived. And he said he would save a special type clipping. And the theme of the clipping was always this. Mr. Gildy walked into the custody of the police today. He admitted the theft of $20,000 from the city treasury over the past 12 years. So often, murderers, firebugs, people guilty of all types of crime would give themselves up into the custody of the police when they had never been detected because their consciences got the better of them. It proves that there is something within ourselves to share what's on the inside. Did you ever get filled up with something so much that unless you shared it with another individual, you thought you were going to burst? There's only one area of life where that must be done, and that's in the area of serious moral culpability. We call it mortal sin, and it must be confessed. And until we do, 
we won't find that peace that our God wants us to have. And if it's very difficult to go to confession, as soon as you go in, just tell the priest, Father, would you help me? And if you ever say that to one of our priests, you twist it right into a pretzel. He can't do anything but be nice to you. In fact, if he gave you a rough time, then I think the Lord would pin his ears right back because you're a bruised reed and a bruised reed must be handled with kid gloves. Somebody gave me this beautiful watch here. I'd like to offer this watch to any man or to any lady for her best male friend. If ever, ever, even once, you hear a rough word from one of our priests in the confessional. I know you'll never hear it from me because the morning that we were ordained, I said a prayer to God with all my heart and I asked the Lord to strike me dead before that unkind word would come out in the confessional. Not in the classroom, that's another forum, but in the confessional, nothing but the gentle approach. When St. Vincent de Paul was on his deathbed at the age of 79, he made a confession which to the priest who heard it was just an ordinary confession. And this French priest who was hearing the confession proceeded to barrel into Father Vincent. He said to him, Father Vincent, don't you think you had better make a deathbed confession because this is likely to be the last confession you'll ever make? And Father Vincent looked up into the priest's eyes and he said to him, Father, I've been making every one of my confessions as though it were my last confession, as though it were my deathbed confession. I hope, hope I pray that all of us can say the same thing someday. I've been making every one of my confessions as though it were my last confession, as though it were my deathbed confession. Can you think of a better way to anticipate the judgment than by befriending the judge in this beautiful, wonderful, peaceful tribunal of God's loving mercy and kindness in the sacrament of penance. Look at Jesus on the cross, both hands raised, poised, pierced to give you, to give me his absolution. That's the grace that we've won from our God so that no matter when he calls us, we will be ready because we have made our peace with him. And don't expect peace until you've come clean with our God. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. The great message of our Holy Father is evangelization, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody whose lives we touch. And St. Francis wanted that too. He told us to preach the gospel everywhere. If necessary, use words. One beautiful definition of evangelization is this one. Evangelization is one sinner telling another sinner where the confessional is. Another definition of evangelization, one orphan telling his brother where their mother is, Holy Mother of the Church and the Virgin Mother of God. But the definition I like the best of evangelization is evangelization is one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is, the bread that came down from heaven, the body of Jesus Christ. And unlike ordinary bread, which becomes part of us when it's consumed, this food is just the opposite. This is the food that makes us, like Christ, Christ-like. And if we're struggling with big temptations, the Holy Eucharist is the answer. If you're struggling with perhaps lesser type temptations to maybe like some of those sins of the tongue, 
The Holy Eucharist is a tremendous help there as well. Because even though you may take the Lord on your right and you put them on the soft cushion from within your tongue, just think what happens there. The Son of God comes into our frame on the, the beautiful gift that we have, the use of our speech, our tongue. So you can readily see the inconsistency the incongruity, the total unfairness of using those tongues of ours for receiving the all-holy Son of God on and then to go out and use those tongues for those other rotten, nasty purposes. Maybe cursing and swearing, taking God's name in vain, telling the off-color joke and story, using obscene language, telling lies, calumny, contumely, violation of secrecy. Ask God for the grace the next time you receive him to keep that tongue good and kind and reverent for him. And if you're really interested in striving for Christian perfection, and that's the goal of every one of us, to become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, the Holy Eucharist is the key, without a doubt, for married couples, too, to live out that commitment for a lifetime and unselfish love, the energy that comes from the Holy Eucharist is indispensable. We deal with love in terms of union. When you love somebody, you want to be united with them body and soul if you can. And with our God here in the Holy Eucharist, it's not just a question of hugging and kissing our God or embracing our God, even in such a very, very intimate thing as a marriage embrace. With our God here in the Holy Eucharist, it's actually a question of eating our God. Not in the cannibalistic form of a former Papua New Guinea, where they eat human flesh, and they did, but only the flesh of the enemy after a battle. You and I eat the flesh and drink the blood during the battle while we're all part of this church militant, striving, fighting to win our place in the embrace of our God for all eternity. And we are not cannibals, though, because the manner of the eating and the drinking is the unbloody way he gave himself to us the night before he died. And we show that death of the Lord by a separate consecration of the bread this is my body, and a separate consecration of the cup. And when you drain somebody's blood from their body, you bring about their death. But Jesus cannot die anymore. The death is a mystical, mysterious kind of death because the Lord that we bring to the altar is the risen Lord, just as he is now with his glorified risen body in heaven, and he cannot suffer anymore. What a gift this is to each one of us. If anybody ever has a problem with self-esteem, respond to those beautiful gifts of sacraments from our God, like the sacrament of penance. He loves me enough that he's willing to wash my soul with his precious blood. He loves me enough that he's willing to give himself to me under the forms of bread and wine. Love defines itself also in terms of giving. A giver is a lover. A lover is a giver. Love expresses itself, proves itself, increases itself by giving. And not even Almighty God himself could have given us any more than he did in this, the sacrament of his love. God had to become a man a little baby just like you and me once, before he could grow up to fill up the chalice of his suffering with the last drop of his precious blood. And if the mind of God had not devised and invented this wonderful way of giving himself to us, no human mind could have ever dreamed it possible to come into such a close, such a personal union with him. We eat our God. And that's his message in chapter 6 of St. John. He who eats my flesh 
drinks my blood has everlasting life. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Jesus promised he would be with his church all days, even to the consummation of the world. Do you think he could have left his church in error for 1,600 years until the reformers came along 400 years ago to throw out the altar of sacrifice and with it the priesthood to substitute their ambos? If that's the kind of God he is making such promises and not keeping them, I really would not want to have anything to do with him. But he keeps his promises and he will be with us in this way, his presence par excellence, until the last priest is able to get behind that altar to confect the sacrament, to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of the risen Lord. This is the greatest gift of God to us, the one that cost him the most, the one for which he had to pay the dearest price, the gift of himself in the sacrament of his love. Our St. Francis said he saw nothing corporally, physically of the Most High Son of God, but his most holy body and blood which priests receive and which they alone administer to others. It is a question of faith. It's the same faith that it took to believe that that little bundle of seven or eight pounds born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago was the Son of God. The same faith to believe that he is able to take up residence under the form of bread and wine. If I can believe the Christmas story, the enfleshment of our God, the incarnation, I have no problem at all with the Holy Thursday story, the gift of himself in the sacrament of his love. We put no limits to the power of our God. And that's why we believe this with all our heart. The source, the summit of the Christian life, the sacramental life, the priestly life. Yes, we know that God is present in all of nature. Without God's presence there, everything would just disintegrate or be annihilated. He's in his word, the sacred scripture. Our God is in his church in a very special way and the magisterium or the teaching authority of the church. He's in all of us, actually or potentially, where the kingdom of God reigns if we allow him to come. But his real presence, his physical presence, his sacramental presence is right here in the sacrament of his love. What a gift that we have. Not even God himself could have given us any more. Faith means we're willing to die in testimony of a truth. Given the opportunity and the grace of God, I think we could all die for this truth. But what we really need is a big plus sign behind faith that spells out the word conviction. Conviction means we're willing not just to die in testimony of a truth, but that we're also willing to live in accordance with the truth. Like the conviction of our father Robert, a Polish Capuchin Franciscan father who was interned at the Dachau prison camp in Germany during the Second World War. He told us that life there in that camp was literally a hell on earth. He said for one thing the prisoners had to supplement their diets. They could get enough to eat only by helping themselves to the garbage cans of the enemy officers. And he said the grass soup that they gave them to eat was fit for nothing else but to wash out their socks in. He said it was a hell on earth until the night the priest prisoners managed to smuggle in bread and wine to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass. He said they offered holy mass in just a few minutes, the bare essentials right around the consecration. And then he said they had to be careful to whom they gave the Holy Eucharist because some of those men almost died of ecstasy so much did they love him, so much had they missed him. Would that we had conviction like that to receive the Lord worthily as frequently as we possibly can 
every Sunday of our lives and every holy day of obligation, as long as we are in the state of grace, with no serious, unrepented, grave, or serious mortal sins on our soul, and that we come to the table of the Lord with the right intention, with the idea of pleasing God. Some people define history as man's quest for food. Religious people define history as man's quest for God or God's quest for man. In the Holy Eucharist, all of these definitions come together. History is man's quest for God who has made himself our food. When they asked Cardinal Newman why he became a Catholic and gave up a most influential position in the Church of England, he gave us his reason. He said, I want to receive one Holy Communion. He wanted this food of the soul because he really knew from reading the Fathers of the Church that something happened in the ordination ritual of the Anglican Church when the matter and form was changed. Did they have a valid priesthood? Pope Leo XIII clarified that later on. And that's why the greatest mind probably in the English-speaking world as an apologist came into the Church of Rome, the Holy Catholic Church. He is surely an inspiration for us to give up all that he had to submit to the truth because of the Holy Eucharist. It's sad these days, though, to see what's happened to the Holy Eucharist in so many places. Minimalized, marginalized, trivialized, casualized, and in some places even ostracized. Before his death some 20 years ago, Bishop Fulton Sheen often spoke of the de-Eucharistization of the church. The effort it seemed on the part of some people to get rid of the Eucharist, at least the understanding of the Eucharist, as it has been accepted by the church for 2,000 years, was it an embarrassment in the ecumenical movement that we eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God? For some people, that really has been a stumbling block. But we do believe it with all our hearts. And we beg God for the grace to persevere in that belief until we die. Like Mrs. Kardash, my dear brother Joe's mother-in-law from St. Felix Parish in Freedom, Pennsylvania, our father Guy Golden was her pastor, and he brought Holy Communion to her, her viaticum, that food for her trip into eternity. And he said to her, Mrs. Kardash, the body of Christ. And she said, Amen. And she opened her mouth. She put her tongue out. Father Guy put the sacred host on her tongue. She closed her mouth, swallowed the host, and she died right then and there from that beautiful act of faith in the presence of the risen Lord in the Holy Eucharist to hopefully the beatific vision immediately upon her entry into eternal life. That's the grace that we all pray for, that beautiful gift of final perseverance, believing to the end amidst all the hurts of life. I've often wished I could win the Pennsylvania State Lottery to implement a little study that I've been thinking about. Wouldn't it be interesting if, of a weekday morning in a certain Catholic church, instead of giving the body of the Lord to every person who would come up, the priest instead would bring down a big fat wad of $100 bills. Instead of giving them the Holy Eucharist, he gave each one a crisp, $100 bill. I bet there'd be lines in that church that not even all the state police could control the mobs. But what's $100? Well, 
or $100 billion compared with the precious body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's like a raindrop to an ocean by comparison with the eyes of faith. And we all have the eyes of faith if we're baptized. Faith, though, is not a diamond. I can take a diamond and throw it into the river. I can hide it under a carpet, stuff it in a mattress. It'll stay a diamond. Faith is not like that. Faith is a tiny little seedling that must be nourished and cherished with the proper nutrients and moisture and sunshine so it can grow. And I'm afraid in the lives of so many people, even though they have been baptized, faith is not alive. I hear too what the German Lutheran theologian Lafater said. If he could bring himself to believe what Catholics believe in regard to the Holy Eucharist, he said, he would never get up off his knees. And that's what happens in the poor Clare community. So many of them where they have the personnel to do it, they're before the Blessed Sacrament day and night, if possible, adoring the risen Lord in the great sacrament. The miracle that puts the Lord there is called transubstantiation. The substance of the bread and wine is actually annihilated in virtue of the words of consecration. And in its place, the presence of the risen Lord through the operation of the Holy Spirit and the words spoken by the priest. And he has that power in virtue of his holy ordination. When God said fiat, he created light. He created heaven and earth. When Mary said fiat, God became man. And when the priest says his fiat over the bread and the wine with the epiclesis, the invocation of the Holy Spirit, the all-powerful Son of God becomes obedient to the words, to the command of his priest, and takes up residence under the form of bread and wine. Herein you and I become the companions of our God. Companion is a beautiful word. Kum means with, and panis is bread. We break bread with our God. Only the bread that we break is his most precious body and blood. And that's the source of the enthusiasm for the evangelization of all those who would want to follow in the spirit of St. Francis to share the good news enthusiasm from those two Greek words en which means in or from within and theos which means God God from within and what better way to realize that than by taking the God of Jesus Christ wet it into our frame every single day of our lives if that's possible making a worthy preparation and a decent Thanksgiving after communion Sometimes I think our Lord could be entertained much, much better in the homes of our hearts when he comes there, when we receive him sacramentally. Do you know he's within us after communion for about 10 or 15 minutes, as long as the species remain, just as he is now with his glorified risen body in heaven? And you and I then, after Holy Communion, have equivalently what the Virgin Mother of God had when she conceived Christ nine months before his birth, only with Mary, Jesus was within her reproductive organs. With you and with me, he is right within our digestive tract for as long as the species remain. And if you ever want something from God, oh, it's great to make a novena, even to go on pilgrimage to Medjugorje or to Rome or to Assisi or to Lourdes or Fatima or Guadalupe, wonderful what are these, these apparitions of our Blessed Lady? Because the whole purpose of an apparition is to bring us to Christ, and we have him right here with us all the time, and he invites us to come. See, when we pray, we don't change God. God is absolutely immutable. If he could be changed, he would not be God, because change implies going from a lesser to a greater state or from a greater to a lesser state. And you can never predicate that of God. Our God is pure act, pure love, trying to invade your soul and mine. 
And what better timing for that than when the sacred Eucharistic heart of Jesus Christ rests and lives and beats right within our own for as long as the species remain. When Robert Bruce was on his deathbed, he called his best friend to his bedside who was a Lord Douglas, and he said, Douglas, when I die, I want you to do me a favor. After the funeral mass is over, I want you to take a knife and cut out my heart and take it with you with our men to Palestine, to the land that was sanctified by the feet of our Lord and our attempt to win back the holy places from the hands of the unbelievers. So after the death of Robert, Bruce's dying request was respected. They took a knife, they cut out his heart, put it in a small golden casket, and Lord Douglas took this heart with him to Palestine. But just as the forces of Robert Bruce and Lord Douglas had set one on Palestinian soil, they were attacked by the Moors. And the Moors were just about ready to throw them back into the Mediterranean when this Lord Douglas thought of something very clever, very dramatic. He got up in front of his men and he was holding this heart of Robert Bruce. And he turned to his men and he shouted just as loud as he could, where the heart of Robert Bruce was wont to go, there go you. And then he took this heart and fired it right in among the enemies. And the followers of Douglas and Bruce, anxious, burning, on fire to recover the heart they loved most dearly, went in among the enemy, tore them to shreds, and won the day for the Christian side. May we, we priests, and you who love your priests with the love of Jesus Christ, so love not the heart of Robert Bruce, but the sacred Eucharistic heart of Jesus Christ, so that we can model ourselves after that heart, by being good, solid Catholic Christians, and then to take that heart and fire it in among the enemy, no matter where our vocation may take us, to the inaccessible regions of Papua New Guinea or the Macadam jungles or the Mon Valley around Pittsburgh, to acknowledge that he's the redeemer of them as well as of us, so that we can do our own little part to win the day for Jesus Christ.